G'day all, welcome to the Hardly Adequate Podcast. My name is Desi and I'm a content developer and your podcast host for today. This is a podcast series where I generally interview people and chat to them about cyber and how they got into it. And today is no different. We're talking with Jacob Latonis, who actually featured on my Hardly a Week series. And then he reached out and we're going to talk about Yara today, but we're also going to get into some of his background as well. So uh, if you're interested in learning more, jump onto my Discord server. You can grab an invite from my website, hardlyadequate.com. But for now, welcome, Jacob. Thanks for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. As always, we always start off with kind of introducing people and, and figuring out where they started and how they got to where they are. So maybe you could just give us a rundown of how you got to where you are now in your cybersecurity job. Sure, absolutely. So currently, I'm a uh, senior software engineer on the threat research team at Proofpoint. But how I got there, I started out in theoretical computer science in university. So just pure, you know, software engineering algorithm stuff. And I started to apply for internships and I just kind of fell into one into security. I got a couple offers for an internship and one of them happened to be in Chicago for cybersecurity. And I was like, well, that one sounds cooler than just software engineer. So I kind of just accepted that one. And then from there, the interest kind of peaked, you know. And I went from intern to full-time at the same organization. Started out in the security operations center. So reading logs, you know, seeing um, if anything was worthy yeah. to escalate up to our internal IR team. I'm sure you know how that goes. And then from there, I, I was an analyst in the SOC for uh, about a year, year and a half. And then I pivoted over. We had an opening on our threat intel team. And I pivoted over to the threat intelligence team. And we got some experience writing, you know, like finished reports and, and tracking threat actors that were relevant to our business vertical. The vertical at the time was like, you know, fintech, financial, all that fun stuff. And then from there, I kind of pivoted back into using my software engineering background because I missed it a lot. Uh, and I became the de facto, like security engineer, I guess is the proper term. Writing like plugins and things for MISP, if, you've, if you use MISP as a threat intelligence platform. And then joined the vendor side with a company called Arctic Wolf, uh, mm -hmm. which is a MDR vendor. And then I was a, Oh, I don't know what my official title was. I think it was senior security developer there. So I did detection development and content as well as internal tooling. Uh, and then I joined Proofpoint uh, almost a year ago and I'm the, the lead like internal tools dev for the, the threat research team here. So I build out tools that, that help us track threat actors, internal tooling that helps with, with pretty much any part of an analyst workflow that, that can be you know, either assisted by or enhanced by tooling. Yeah, yeah. That's a, it's, it's super funny. It's probably like its own talk in itself, but like how people get into cybersecurity and there's like all these labels around the junior positions and the entry level positions at the moment. But then you, as you get higher and higher up, it just blurs. Like you kind of, oh, yeah. When you're like, oh, hey, I've got this like background in software engineering. They're like, oh, cool, we need this done. And you're like, all right. And like, I'll just go do that. And you, you don't even know what your job title is anymore because you're just like doing a whole bunch of things. Oh, yeah. It definitely blends together. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I also wanted to say, like, I'm interested to know, when did you start your internship where you were like, you saw that cybersecurity job offer and you were like, oh, that sounds interesting. Like, what year was that? So my undergrad was a bit of an anomaly. I did undergrad in three years. So technically it was between my first and second year, but it would have been people's normally their second, like between second and third year. I'm not sure what it is in, in Australia, but that'd be our sophomore year of, of undergrad. But what, what year was that? Oh, sorry. 20. No, I, uh, I'm a, I'm a little bit younger. Uh, 20, 2018, I think. Okay. Okay. Interesting. There was a bit, bit later. I just remember like, so in Australia in 2015, it kind of mirrored my story a little bit when like I, I joined the military, but they were like, Oh, do you want to do cybersecurity? And I was like, what's that? And they're like, Oh, it's stuff to do with computers. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it yeah. sounds cool enough. Like I'll just go do it. But it wasn't until like cyber really kicked off, I think like maybe around 20, 2017, 2018 through to like before the pandemic when everyone was trying to get in because they're like, oh, this sounds like a really cool job. So interesting to hear that you were kind of just like, oh, that sounds interesting. I'll just go do that, but didn't really have much of an idea at the time. You were just like, yeah, sounds cool. The university, I went to the University of Wisconsin and they have a big like research background in academia. And I started to take security courses like my, my final year of undergrad. And I was the, the difference between like security and enterprise versus like security and academia just like blew my mind. Like the, the <laughs> difference of, of like what, what people consider just like realistic and actual expectations was just, it was mind blowing. 
because I, I've got another podcast that I do with Forensic Focus and my co-host like works with universities as like, because he consults, but he also works with universities. And it's always interesting when you go to those academic conferences where they mm-hmm. they talk about what's achievable and, and what they can do. Um, and you're just like, this people don't have enough time to implement this or it'll interrupt a workflow, which is just like the company's going to go, no, we're not doing that. So, yeah, pretty interesting. The it, Like there's still that gap between academia and, and actual operations. So, yeah. Absolutely. But that was good. Thanks for the explanation, man, kind of where yeah, you came absolutely. from. Super interesting. But we'll get into why... Uh, we've got you onto the podcast, which is to discuss Yara. Now, I mentioned on my, if, for those that have listened to the Hardly a Week, I was at like a, a workshop for the last company that I worked for. And I, someone asked me, they were like, because in the audience, we had a mix of like OT or ICS operators and then IT people. And a lot mm-hmm. of them aren't in security. So they don't know like a lot of the tools. And, and Yara has been around for a while. And someone was like, oh, can you just explain Yara? And I was like, it's one of those things that you just feel like you just know someone says Yara and you you have this feeling of, oh, God, I'm going to have to go read the docs. <laughs> and I couldn't really explain it. So maybe you could do a better job because um, you had had the blog, which kind of got us to here. But maybe you could explain what Yara is on the whole, why we use it and, and why it's some people think it's cool. And I kind of like get a feeling of dread. Sure. So like TLDR, like highest level abstraction, Yara is a pattern matching utility. So you can feed it a bunch of patterns, whether it's just straight strings. Sorry, my cat is trying to climb the wall. Sorry, <laughs> let me let me restart. Uh, Yara in, in its like essence is, is a pattern matching utility. So you can provide it strings and then it will scan across the whatever file that you want to scan. And it'll tell you if those strings or patterns match it anywhere. You can get a lot more in depth than that. You can go with regex patterns. Um, you can go like down to the byte level. Um, if you don't want to do strings and you want to look for like certain like sets of bytes, so whether that's like a, a PE header or you know something something that you're interested in finding. And then from there, it's it's really efficient at searching for said patterns. And then so that's the engine itself. And then the YAR rules you can define whichever, however like the configuration that you would like to search. So you can define rules and say this string and this string or this string and this, you know, regex pattern, et cetera. Mm. Um, and you can, yeah, you can, you can write rules and it's, it's fairly efficient. It's, it gets more efficient when we get into to Yara X, which is Yara written in Rust, but I'm sure we can dive into that later. Your blog, I actually did know, and that's the first I've heard of it. I didn't even realize that Yara X was even out and that they'd written in Rust. Like I, I know Rust is kind of said to be more efficient and a lot of like malware authors are moving towards writing malware in Rust that kind of stuff but when we when you mentioned it kind of scans on a file it's not just a file right like we can point it at memory and then because mm-hmm. where i see it a lot is kind of like you see the different certs put out rules or the the kind of well-known ones that i jump to the top of my mind and like the florian roth rule sets where they'll actually like what i immediately think of when i think of yara is the rules to scan memory for cobalt stripe beacons Yep. is all mimicats, for those like implants. the most common yeah. kind of things. And it's looking for memory patterns within memory on system. So it's it's also good at not just, I guess, static files finding on a system, but also live memory, right? Yep. A lot of EDRs will, will leverage Yara to, to continually scan memory or any things like that. And then from there, they, uh, they'll either like perform a memory dump or something to, to keep it there and then send it over to, to wherever to have it further analyzed. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah. It's pretty great. So... Because how long, like, I might be putting you on the spot here, but maybe you could give, give us a bit of history to Yara. Like, do you know how long it's been around for? And then when when did we move to Yara X? And is that kind of the trend that we're looking in the industry to move more towards Yara X? So as it stands currently, Victor um, Alvarez over at Virus Total slash Google, whatever I, I guess they should be called now, is the, like, core maintainer of Yara. And, oh, man, as to how long it's been around, I guess we can go to the, the commits on GitHub and, and look. <laughs> just um, look at that. And the, the very and last page. I wonder if I just, like, now that they're owned by Google, Yara, I feel like 1905 is way too early, and I'm looking at the <laughs> Yara. 2013. Okay. Uh, so, so it's been around uh, for 10, 11 yeah. years. Yeah. Do you think, I guess, like, what commercial internet was? Like, 97. Yeah, somewhere yeah. there. Yeah, okay. 
so yeah, pretty much around since the the birth of commercial internet, really. Like as I guess we started caring more about malware. Yeah, once once security like got to be somewhat important and was stopped. Yeah, just, like, once someone's bank account road. got got drained, they're like, oh, <laughs> yeah, okay. exactly. So with Yara, Yara, in its essence, or like as it stands right now, is currently written in C. The the one that's currently used, like if you go on Yara, if you go on Virus Total and use the Yara package for Live Hunt or Retro Hunt or things like that, it uses the C version currently. It's pretty complex. Like the code base is. It's obviously over time for the past, you know, 11 years, it's grown um, yeah. and things have been added, things have been changed. Um, and Victor decided to kind of put in effect a change freeze on the C version of Yara try, and wanted to go experiment with Yara X, which is the Rust version. And then so right now it's mainly about porting one to one utility from or efficacy from Yara and C to Yara X and Rust. And then. The other thing is new features, he prefers that the pull request be made to Yara X instead of Yara. Right. That way things don't have to continually be ported over. Uh, and that's why I started the with the 100 days of Yara, I started doing Yara X contributions. As it stands right now, Yara X isn't deployed anywhere like in a production sense for VirusTotal, to my knowledge. It's, it's still just the base Yara. Uh, but you can compile it and build it and run it however you'd like um, from source and use it if you would like to. Right. So is, is, I guess, the main drivers to change it to Rust would obviously be the efficiency that Rust carries and simplifying the code base, it sounds like. That and then memory safety was a big one. Uh, as with, right. with reading in files and the like, just kind of how C operates with it, uh, you can be fairly safe, but there's still always a little bit of an inherent risk. And Rust provides a little bit stricter guidelines on memory safety for that. And, and that's, I think, one of the other, the other major ones. Because, like, for example, um, with the Mach O module for parsing, like, Mac OS binaries, uh, mm -hmm. there were some security worries um, about the C module for it, so it never got pushed into the production instance of Yara. But when it was ported over to Rust, those security vulnerabilities were fixed, and then it's actually just built into Yara X from the get-go now instead. You don't have to enable it, like, with a custom flag. So it's, it's little things like that that like, you know, allow the community to iterate a little bit faster and, and have a lot of these features that may not have made it into the, the original one. Yeah, okay. And I, I guess it also drives like, it's kind of the most popular languages are the better ones to program in because the community is bigger to fix these issues. Whereas there's less and less people that I can think of that, like I, I learned C when I was at uni. I was never great at it, but like I'm much better at Python now because the community is bigger and there's more courses on it and stuff. Oh yeah, absolutely. See, and if see you have more a question, Rust. Yeah, yeah, you have a question. Some someone sitting in their living room is uh yeah, answering it. Especially if I'm wrong, because they'll be like <laughs> You get called out immediately. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's the that's the one thing that I've I've been a little scared about with the hundred days of Yara, like with each contribution, I know someone's gonna go to my pull request and be like, You idiot, why did you do it this way? And I'll be like, Well, you know, it works. So It's the forever like daunting thing about content generation and it's the one thing that i i know because like i make content for students in that students will always complain and it's just like you just have to accept that and it's almost like all right if you can do better fix it and that's kind of like where the at least like if you're doing like git pushes like at least you know someone else smarter is probably looking over it and can fix things whereas yeah if you're making stuff for students they'll just complain oh yeah <laughs> yeah it's I haven't had anyone call me out yet. I'm hoping that the first time it happens, they actually suggest an improvement instead of just, you know, calling me dumb. But we'll, we'll see yeah. when it gets there. <laughs> I feel it because I, I have a few mates that are in, into like this kind of development, especially around security tools. And I, I feel like the community is pretty good. Like people who are committing time to like reading these things, like want to improve it. And if they're looking at something, usually they can make a suggestion. So Absolutely. Yeah. For sure. People are probably just happy that you're doing it. Because you're like contributing, right? Like that's that's the whole point about these communities. As you say, I think the this is the first time with 100 Days of Yara that someone, uh, me being someone in this instance, has decided to to do development instead of rule content itself. So it's it's pretty interesting to see how the community reacted mm. to it. It's been it's been they've yeah, been supportive. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like maybe you could touch on that about like the 100 Days of Yara, or or I guess the 100 Days of anything really and the motivation behind that and then how it's how it is beneficial 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for 100 Days of Yara, I think it's been around for four years now. I think that's correct. And it was one of the initial starters was one of my coworkers at Proofpoint, Greg Lesnowich. You'll see him. He retweets literally everything during the 100 Days of Yara season. So you, if you follow the, the hashtag or if you're in one of the groups, uh, you've definitely seen him repost things. But he started it just because he saw a lot of value out of it for he's on our APT research team at Proofpoint. Um, so he sees a lot of value out of it, you know, day in and day out. I, I assume he just wanted to, to garner more adoption for the tool and get more people using it and, and familiar with it. And he and then I think Steve Miller over at, I think Steve's at Mandiant. And they, they both kind of like co-pioneered the, the idea of 100 Days of Yara. And then I believe Victor and, and Wes, Wes is also um, at Google slash virus total kind of, you know, they're, they're all for it and they, they got a community around it and it's been around for three or four years. And the main goal of it, like, like with any of the hundred days of, you know, X, Y, Z is just to, to drive adoption and, and get more people familiar with it. Um, and it's also to give people a chance to, to be vulnerable in like the learning stage and like ask questions mm-hmm. and be able to like hop into discord and be like, Hey, why would I do this? Or like, why would I use this over this in this rule? And there's, there's no dumb questions, right? Like it's like people want to learn and people that are organizing it also want to help. Um, and it, it creates a really cool environment for new people and, you know, veterans of the space to, to hang out and interact. So that's, that's interesting. Cause I guess my, so my hundred days of introduction was definitely not that like, so it sounds like it's the community and the people who, who make it kind of come together and they go for a hundred days, we're going to dedicate time and resources to helping new people, but also fix things wrong with the product whereas my introduction to 100 days was like 100 days of python where it was more you would dedicate 100 days to study and learn it and that could be your self-pay and i'm, I'm sure there's like similar with python like there's 100 days to develop in python 3 and stuff um so it's interesting that you can come at it from two different angles and yeah so talking talking about your blog and, and what drew me to it was and i really like it uh let me see thank you 100 days of yara 2024 it's like really basic the whole page but i do love on the bottom that was like here's to focusing on content improving tools we use every day to protect real people and organizations not worrying about a blog template or color scheme but then you still manage to put a uh, leonardo dicaprio meme in the bottom <laughs> so i really appreciate the uh dedication to memes but that it's just like a real basic blog like kind of i i really like the the lo-fi kind of aspect to things just to, to put it in. But yeah, yeah, the 100 days drew me and then it was just interesting to read. And obviously like Yara X was something that I, I'd never heard of before because, and it sounds like, because it's not being pushed to production, I'm not surprised that I hadn't heard about it, not being in the community, but yeah, interesting. So we kind of talked a little bit before about Yara being pushed to enterprise detection and maybe we can like, you can discuss more about some more use cases that it's used in enterprise and IR and SOC and, and different tools. And um, yeah, just touch on that a little bit. I think one of the biggest use cases that I've seen in the in the IR space is like most orgs, or if it's not an org, it, it may be like you know a vendor, um, will have a preset package of rules that they're wanting to run, like when an incident happens, just to mm. see you know what what might be in the environment or you know what what could have like determined, like if it helps determine root cause or or what have you. I'm making it sound a lot simpler than it is, but obviously you know that it's not that simple, but you know, high level, like the IR teams will will use Yara for for things like that. Uh, From the SOC side of things, we used it a lot for like enrichment. So we would have certain Yara rules just for for certain things. Like, you know, like if if we didn't have a static pipeline at the time, we could use Yara rules to determine, you know, file type. Uh, We could draw out certain things uh, and use it in that, that sort of way. So if you have a, uh, like a like a sim or do you have like a, a workflow tool that brings incidents in you can then grab the artifacts from the incidents run yara or whatever over those artifacts if, if you can and then you can grab further enrichment from there the other things that you can do is if you're like an edr or an mdr or what have you uh, a lot of those agents will have a yara engine running like we we mentioned a little bit earlier but mm. they'll have a yara engine running with a, a repository of rules that gets updated on the regular and it'll scan memory it'll also scan you know new files dropped files uh, etc and then with that you can be able to detect things and i can't say real time but you know near real time um, yeah depends yeah, how quickly you can look through the results i guess is uh yeah absolutely 
which is a, a, a big improvement. YARX is a, is a fairly large noticeable improvement for, for larger files. So it's, it'll be interesting to see how, when the time comes, like, you know, EDRs and vendors notice the, the noticeable speed up and improvement. Mm -hmm. So, and with this 100 day of Yara thing, because I, I like I was, before we jumped on the call, in my mind, I, I was thinking like it was a self-imposed 100 days. So my question was going to be like, are you actually on day 11? And I was just reading your blog because you've got, you've listed just your days is going through and, and talking about, I guess, the, the stuff that you're working on. Being in the States, you're only day 10. So is the, the plan is like you're going to be committing to like doing uploading your blog every, for a hundred days yeah it's uh it's a it's a grind for sure uh, <laughs> but yeah the the current plan I worked ahead a little bit at the start so I had some PRs already made that I wanted to talk about right um, okay so there was a little bit of, of work ahead but I've I'm fairly caught up to that now so now it's I'm making PRs you know yeah now it's the grind I'm making PRs to YRX or or similar almost every evening um, yeah. and then the blog post will, will go into detail about it. But the, the nice thing is, uh, as, as you highlighted a little bit earlier, I don't have to worry about, you know, like really how it's presented. Um, I'm, I'm just going to take what I did. I'm going to discuss the, the benefit of it and how analysts might be able to use it. And that's going in the blog post. And then I, you know, tweet it or, or whatever, just so people can see it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it will be 100 days straight. When, when Greg was originally telling me about that, we had a conversation back in like, Oh, I don't know. October or November. Are you familiar with Advent of Code? I've yeah, roughly. Okay, so yeah, it's like a twenty-five days start of December. From yeah, December first to Christmas, you have a coding challenge every night. And I was talking to him about how excited I was for that, and he goes, "Well, you know, that's good, but you should probably rest up because you're going to do a hundred days of Yara next year." And I was like, "Oh, okay, I guess, yeah, for sure." Yeah, that that rest that rest was the six days between Christmas and and January first. Yes. Yeah, it, it was, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and I was thinking about it, and from the work that I do at Proofpoint, I see a lot of people write really cool rules and a lot mm -hmm. of cool ideas, people like Greg and, and everyone else. And there's, a, there's always a long list of, like, I wish Yara did this. And I was like, I know how to develop things. Yara's open source. I'm sure if I get deep enough into the code base, I can start to contribute. And then it kind of just built from there. So it's been exciting, yeah. But but I do have more than a list of 100 things that people have said I wish Yara would do X. So, <laughs> you know, I, I definitely have a, enough things to, to try to implement. It's just uh, doing them in a way that, you know, doesn't burn out. Is the hardest, hardest thing about 100 days of Yara, the conversation that you have to have with your partner and be like, I'm not going to have a social life for 100 days and I can't, can't really see you. I'm going to literally be working and then doing this at night. It's easier for 100 Days of Yara than it is for Advent of Code. Okay. Uh, Advent of Code, they always release at midnight. Uh, so you're, yeah. you're up from midnight to 2 a.m. working on a problem. That one, that one doesn't go over nearly as well as saying, oh, I'm going to spend an extra you know, 45 minutes to an hour and a half yeah. uh, with, yeah. with my laptop. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's better for 100 Days of Yara, but it's definitely still a, <laughs> a topic of conversation in the evening. So maybe we can, like, I, I know I've touched on this on many different podcasts before. But maybe we can just talk about it briefly here because I, I know when we were chatting on LinkedIn before jumping on, this is probably a topic that we could talk about for hours and be its own thing. And you just mentioned then open source. So like briefly, what does that mean? What does it mean to you? And, and I guess, how do you see that that's beneficial for the community? So open source to me, you know, there's there's been arguments over like what it actually is. But open source to me is if the source code is online you can see it you know it's open to the public that's one part but the, the other part is others being able to contribute to that open source because mm -hmm. um, you know some companies will throw source code out there and be like this is it and then they'll people can see it but they don't let anyone contribute or, or make changes but to me the open source part is also the community and the contributions that build from that mm -hmm. um, so any any repository it doesn't have to be on github it can be you know gitlab or bitbucket or whatever other Wherever. i don't know yeah. maybe people still use subversion or something i hope not but maybe but yeah it's it's that open source really boils down to the community in my opinion so having having a community of contributors of users of maintainers um, and being able to build from that on you know kind of not necessarily influence the project but have it you know keep going uh, yeah yeah no, like i i kind of feel the same way like when i when i think open source i think 
the one the projects that the community can develop in and provide feedback and you can actually see improvements be made based on the feedback they're giving or or even if they like yourself if they're developing can actually directly contribute. I th- and I think a great example of that is like, and I think especially in the security space, most people will know is like the Sigma repository. Yeah. Like it's, you know, thousands of people have contributed to that repository. Changes are made, whether it's noisy, maybe it's an experimental rule, um, mm-hmm. but it's it's built by the community. Flor- Florian started it, right? But like it's built by the community and and you see people discussing and, and changing and iterating and it's, it's a really cool thing to see. Yeah, yeah. Especially because like, Everyone in security is, is busy all the time. So you can't, like, Florian couldn't maintain that forever. So it's so good that stuff like that's picked up by the community and kept going because it's so beneficial. Like, it's it's used in so many other tools that, like, if that drops, you'd lose, like, six enterprise tools that yeah. uh, rely on all those Sigma rules. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So you you're probably pretty busy at the moment, but what other, do you have any other like cyber related side projects that you were working on that are on hold or you've like, I'm sure you've got like, like me where you've got this list of things that you'll probably never get around to, but you've got like this wish list of things that you actually want to do as well. For cyber projects, as in like things that aren't like inter- enterprise, like, you know, for Proofpoint, it's, it's pretty short. Uh, yeah. Okay. Honestly, it was just Yara, Yara X contributions were a big one up there. But other than that, I I was doing a little bit of open source contributions to Ruff. Ruff is a, a Python like formatter and linter, right, um, but right. it's written in, it's written in Rust, so it's it's really fast. And I was like, oh, this is this is great. Um, so I contributed to that for a little bit, uh, and that was fun. As a, as of late, uh, as a completely non sequitur to cyber things, I mean like the I just started another marathon training block, so I'm. Right. A, a very large amount of my time is taking up by running and, and all that fun stuff. That's uh, That was going to be my next question is, is your hobbies outside of cyber? So is that like a, you're going for a full marathon? Yep. So I, I ran Chicago, the Chicago Marathon in October, and then I qualified for Boston and Berlin. So I'll run Boston in April and then Berlin in September. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. So, it's, so a, then, it's a full schedule for sure. And then that keeps, like, is that part of like some world marathon competition? So like the, the yeah, sport the, of marathon running, I yeah. guess. Yeah, yeah there's okay. the, the six world marathon majors. And I think Australia is petitioning to be the seventh in, in Sydney. But yeah, there's, there's six currently. So it's Boston, New York, Tokyo, Chicago, London, and Berlin. And so the idea is like if you manage to get into those you run all those and it's like points or that gets you into like another race yeah if you're fast enough you do get like the points in the leaderboard system and they'll rank you and all that fun stuff but otherwise it's kind of just like the six like marquee races that everyone who is a marathoner has to run so to speak that's really cool is like any other like i know we were talking before you've got two cats that probably like get all over your stuff and keep you busy but any other hobbies or, or anything? I've seen some in the background. So that I'll, oh, I'm, have they been walking gonna, around? Yeah, we're going to keep moving towards, we're going to have video on YouTube as well as the podcast. So people will get to see if they're watching YouTube, see some of the cats walking around in the background. Oh, yeah. He, uh, yeah, I have two. I have a small, a small black one. And then I have a, a bigger, uh, I think it's a tabby cat. I think that's the right saying. And he's, he's a big boy. He's like, he's 20 pounds. So he's a large <laughs> cat. But as for other hobbies, I read a lot. I try to I try to read a book a week, so uh, wow. this is this will be my third year running of of trying to read fifty two in a year, which is fun. Keeps me busy. But yeah, other than that, running, reading, coding is the spot all I do. <laughs> like, so I'm interested because like I I struggle to read now. I used to love it, but I read so much for work that I've switched to audiobooks because I like going for walks. So I'll listen to a book while I walk. But what type of reading do you do? Like, is it do you like nonfiction? fiction like something that's completely so, away from work. I like it all I as similar to you I do read a lot for work which some days makes reading really not fun yeah so on those days I really try to gravitate towards like fiction I have books that are like fun to read and then I have books that like I need to read yeah uh, for okay. whether it's work or technical or what have you so it just depends on the day um I I'm not a fan of audiobooks because I space out but I do love the fact that it's another medium for people to like listen to them and like 
I mean, you're still reading. It's just, you know, so I'm a, I'm a big fan of that. I, a lot of my friends use audiobooks throughout the, throughout the workday. I, I kind of find it both ways, right? Like if I'm walking, sometimes I start thinking about something I have to rewind the audiobook. But I also find when I read books, I do the same thing anyway. I start daydreaming and then I'm like, I get like three pages in. And I'm like, I have no idea what happened on those last three pages and I have to go back anyway. So yeah, maybe it's just like my concentration gets to a certain point and I'm like, that's I need to put the book down. I definitely think it's it's like a developed skill. Like I'm sure if mm. like if I listen to more audiobooks, I would learn to listen better. Or similarly, if you know someone who doesn't read, if they just read more, they would get used to it. But uh, it's definitely like a practice skill. And I'm so used to just having like music playing in the background all day in my headphones that like I just kind of you know. Um, but yeah, I'm the same. I I had a notification from YouTube that was just like in the last two weeks you listened to like something ridiculous amount of like hundreds of hours of background music and i was like oh, oh sure yeah it's like hey you okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've got uh youtube now checking in on my well-being we're kind of at the end of the questions that i had is there anything else that you kind of wanted to to mention that you think um the listeners would would benefit from i think the only other thing that i didn't bring up uh in relation to 100 days of yara is we have a discord channel i'm sure i can give you the the link or whatever yeah, throw yeah. the description um, the but link. for those who are who are interested it's you know it's like i mentioned earlier it's veterans in the space and it's also like complete newbies so like people who have never written a yara rule before but are like what is this and it, it's really cool it's a it's a lot of cool interactions i'll chuck the discord link your blog link and your linkedin you know all in the show notes sure. if people want to reach out to jacob or yeah join the the Discord community and get into Yara or, or Yara X. Yeah, absolutely. And if anyone has any questions in, in relation to career contributions to open source, et cetera, I, as I'm sure you can tell by this podcast, I talk a lot and I, I like to talk. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to just throw them at me. Yeah, nice. Well, thanks so much for joining me, Jacob. It's, I'm so happy that you reached out after the, the Harley Week thing. And it's been great talking to you before this and then having you on. And like, I've learned a lot more about YRX that I didn't even know it existed or what it was. Um, and you did a much better job at explaining what YAR is than, than I did in that workshop. So oh, thank you. I'll just refer people to this podcast from now on. If I ever have to do it again, I'll be like, go listen to Jacob. I appreciate that. Thank you. So nearly all of the content is free, but if you want to support, make sure you subscribe to the podcast, like, and subscribe to the YouTube channel, which the podcast will now be on the video or check out my merch from my website, hardlyadequate.com. We can also get links for all of my other content. Thanks for listening and I'll catch you all later on.